What's up, guys? Welcome to Talk Back On. This is where we talk about conversations behind, like the Talk Back Mike. We have our host, Jay, who is one of the founding fathers of K-pop, an award-winning producer slash music composer. We also have Kairos, who is a multi-platinum award and award-winning producer. And myself, KO, I'm an audio engineer producer, and I love vintage gear. Um, so <laughs> this week, <laughs> we're going to be going over circuit board today. Um, I decided to go with, uh, uh, you know, learning a little bit more about saturation rather than just using EQ and compression. We can really shape the sound and get pretty creative with it. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. Hey guys, it's KO here. Today on Circuit Board, we're gonna go over saturation. I think rather than using EQ and compression to shape your sound, I'm gonna show you three different tips on using saturation to really spice up your track. Let's get it. All right, so I got three different sources here that we can use to really shape our sound. Uh, first, it's a slap bass. Second is an 808. And then third is gonna be vocals. So, Let's take a listen to the slap bass and see what it needs. Cool. So it's already got a nice punch to it. However, I think just for it to cut and to mix a little better, we can definitely add a little bit more um, bottom end as well as some attack. So I've been using this plugin a lot and um, I've been in love with it. Black Box Analog Design HG2 from Plugin Alliance. Um, this is a plugin version of the actual hardware. So on this track, once again, I'm just gonna fatten up the bottom and give it a little bit more attack. So I think for sure, I wanna definitely go with the high sound. Put this on loop. That sounded better already. Now you can see that we already brought brought up the attack. So let's play around with the parameters a little bit more until we get the sound that we want. Cool, I dig it. Um, I'm gonna bypass it and then we're gonna play it back. Now this, in my opinion, is gonna really cut through the mix a little better. Um, it's gonna give the bass a little bit more character as well too, and it just makes it sound a lot cleaner than what it was before. Let's move on. Next, we had the 808, and I think when people think about 808s, they focus too much on the low end. Um, granted, today's music is, is very heavily bass driven, um, however, I like to actually work a lot on the mid-range, the mid-high range, to really have it cut through the mix. I think having that definition of the 808 is a lot more important than just having it being booming in your face. So let's dig right in. So I'm just going to play you guys the 808 sound that we have here, and we'll get straight into processing it. So, personally, I think this sounds pretty good the way it is. However, I think it could just use a little bit more distortion and some sort of uh, character. So, I'm going to use Decapitator, which is my favorite. And this Punish button is probably my favorite thing to use. Um, let's do it without it. So you can hear there's not much going on. However, with the punish button on,
now we're really getting somewhere. So what I'm gonna do from here is I really like how it sounds already. Um, if I really wanna crank it up, I could turn up the drive a lot more. However, I'm just gonna actually use the mix knob to bring it back a little bit. Oh, that sounds nice. I'm gonna play without it. Cool. As you can hear, now the 808's actually got a lot more uh, high mid-range as well as mid-range character for it to really cut through the mix. Um, you're gonna be, the 808's are always gonna be competing with low-end instruments such as other bass instruments as well as kicks. Even synths nowadays have so much low-end. Um, so what I like to focus on a lot is trying to bring up its character in different other ranges of the frequency because 808's already have so much energy. Um, it's kind of better to really emphasize certain other parts of uh, the frequency range. So last but not least, let's move on to the vocals. This is the lovely Chio from Twice. Let's play back her vocals. <laughs> cool. I think for here, vocals were recorded really clean. Um, however, I feel like it could just use a little bit more character. Um, in this case, I love using this Kazrog True Iron. Um, this kind of gives a nice little thickness. Um, it could also brighten up the vocals. Uh, there's just so many things that you could do with it. Um, so let's just dive straight into it. <laughs> So I'm going to play around with the voicings first and then bring up the strength as well too. I, mean, I usually like to go just full out and just find something that works. If, it, if it's too strong, I can always use the mix knob to dial it back. Cool. Personally, I love this 4001B, so I'm going to keep it like that, and let's just dial back the string. Cool. Now I'm going to use this crush fe feature, which is really going to start bringing in some sort of harmonic distortion, um, and it's going to really make the vocals cut through the mix as well. Cool, I think it could go a little bit higher and we'll play it back. Cool, with saturation, it adds such little details sometimes, but all those little details actually add up to really make it shine in the mix. Um, I think the important takeaway here is to really be creative with your production as well as your mixing, um, and not just rely on just certain dynamic processing tools. Instead, try giving it some character and making it stand out, um, and that could really give your your mix uh, a di whole new different type of flavor. Um, it's just like using vintage gear. Sometimes we use diff different types of gear, recording gear setups, um, just to make sure we capture uh, a source the best we can. So feel free to play around with, uh, with it. This, any type of plugins will work, um, and, but I can guarantee you that it will add a whole new level in your, in your production as well as your uh, creative process. Enjoy, guys. Welcome back, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Um, what do you guys think in terms of saturation? Is there certain ways that you guys like to um, use it and color your sounds?
it's it's something that I've been really getting into late lately, recently actually. Um, you know, it's 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 that missing uh, missing ingredient. I found out. You know, uh, I think with especially with like some vocals, especially uh, you know, just to add some strength to some vocals, maybe make it a little more aggressive, like with some dance tracks or even hip hop. Uh, saturation is like, I don't know. I guess it's kind of like, you know, saturation thing on photos, right? When you when you mess with the saturation, it kind of fills in the the empty kind of i don't know it's like the nukes and crannies in the audio it just kind of fills it all in right and it just kind of gives it life so i like i like to put it on vocals sometimes and i, I put it on drums a lot uh to kind of add you know more punch uh and, and it's it has a different kind of a result in compressors or eqs like you said the Abbey road saturator from waves is killer by the way that was one of the yeah uh, i was just using that today oh really actually yeah for the first time i i always use uh i was using the new on uh the black box two. Oh, cool from, from oh, plugin nice. alliance that one's yeah. dope yeah because you could dial in the exact frequency of the the saturation oh, wow. i'm so mad because i picked up that i picked up their first plugin like two weeks before they released the second version oh uh, same here and then <laughs> yeah, i was like what is this two right and then it's like a <laughs> and then there's no like upgrade uh discount either like yeah. you, just, you just have to buy the new one and it's really cool because you could you could kind of zone in on a certain frequency to saturate and then also uh kind of tweak the the width of it so yeah. like you could kind of widen the mix uh, at a certain frequency range so yeah. it's, it's that's really cool so something that i've been kind of messing with but before that i was uh, pretty much using like slate audio stuff uh they have the saturation uh, series, you know, like I forget it was like London, New York, and something. Oh. Uh, I forget, like I don't. Oh, but um, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Is that yeah, BCC, I think that's what it's called. Oh uh, well, they got they got the console thing too, but it's like this uh, oh. saturation series, and it just it's just three different saturators, like, and they all have like different characters, and. I'm really bad with names because I usually just have a, a like a default preset that I make, and so when I open up a set, uh, like a template, it just it's just there. So I never really look at the names of these plugins. So uh, I apologize for that, but yeah, but I I, I always love the the slate uh, the saturators. How would you guys utilize a preset, um, and how would you approach it in terms of where you start with the preset? I uh, usually, I mean. Uh, I mean, of course, I, you know, I start with the factory, you know, kind of default. Yeah. And then I kind of, like, what I do is I usually just, uh, I have two different presets, one for male and one for female. Oh. So, so like, and then, and then I'll start there, and depending on the character of the voice, I would kind of tweak it a little bit here and there, and then I would pretty much save it for each of the singers that I, yeah. you know, work with, I guess, make a separate preset for them. And then, so when they come in, uh, we could just kind of start there and then kind of, mm. uh, tweak it as needed. But, uh. I rarely use actual like presets that are provided by the the manufacturers, you know. Right. Uh, like yeah, sometimes I feel like just the the gain staging isn't right or something. It just doesn't sound right. <laughs> like I, I open up a, a factory preset. I love how <laughs> you just said that there's a setting for male and there's setting for female, especially you know when we are working with different um, keys and ranges, and it does matter uh, how much energy goes into um, even the plugins and you know the input. Uh, um gain and then how that's going to affect the rest of the chain so absolutely i think that is a very uh good tip when it comes to uh presets yeah open your thoughts cool. um yeah I, I mean it's there's different types of presets or something that i would consider like presets there's one like a starting place like let's just say there are just certain sounds that i've messed with and i've been using it repetitively just through like a certain plugin or a certain effect that I want to achieve, I'd have a preset for that. But there's also certain presets where it's just kind of like uh, like my default. For example, if um, like uh, like the biggest thing would be like mastering. I know I always cut 20 hertz anyways, so mm -hmm. I'll just set a preset, just a default preset with just a 20 hertz cut. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think definitely, especially for us where time is limited, uh, we'd like to work efficiently and more than presets just being like a template of some sort it's just for help it just helps us just to get to our sound faster and and uh, it allows us to be a little bit more creative too sure have you have you tried using those like like the waves uh, what do you call that like the rack thing where you could actually like have a the entire 
chain in one plugin. Yeah. Do you use that? The summon? Um, no, it's it's kind of like how Sound Toys and um, oh. I think Slate does it too, right? With their yeah, just one plugin and you have your entire chain on there. So like you just have to load up one preset for the entire, you know, like your vocal chain. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's what's well, called Studio Rack or something. I think a Waves. Again, I'm I'm really bad with names. <laughs> Um, yeah, IK Multimedia came out with that mix box thing. And that thing's really cool. I've been playing around with that, but it's pretty much essentially like what Slate's doing as well, too, where um, they would have like the LA2As and 1176. And, but yeah. um, you get to be pretty, it's kind of cool because it's just being able to just make one chain with one plugin in a sense. Yeah, the, the crazy thing is like, uh, you know, it comes with presets from different like engineers, right? And then like uh, when you open up some of these presets and you look at the vocal chain and you're like, wow, like, you know, it's, it's like something I would never do, like logically, but then, you know, they have it set up a certain way and it makes sense. And you're like, wow, you know, and you learn so much from just looking at the vocal chain of yeah. how they did certain things, right? So uh, it's a good place to start too sometimes like. They have like maybe like a preset for vocals or like piano or something, and then it just has all like drums. Especially, they have like different settings for drums, and it just completely changed the uh, the tone of the drums. And like, and you can see the approach of how they did it, and it just it's pretty amazing. Would you would you possibly consider if you had to tour now to just bring a laptop and an Apollo and your guitar and just uh, an sim? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm I'm kind of like kind of scared of computers on stage uh, like you know I, I've had you know like a lot of people like don't realize when you put computers on like uh, you know on a vibrating stage yeah. a lot of times it'll it'll jam the hard drive uh, you know I, I, I'm you know, a lot of people use like SSD drive now right solid state but like uh, you know if you're using like a spinning hard drive a lot of times it'll freeze it so like you know, sometimes, you know, it works perfectly in a rehearsal studio. And then when you get on stage and the volume's like, you know, like 20 times louder. Right. Uh, and they freak out because the music stops in the middle of the show. <laughs> you know, so uh, like it, that, that kind of freak. Like I had a few times when that happened. So like I'm so I still have that trauma. So like every time I'm using a computer on stage, I'm like dead afraid. It's going to just die like on stage. So what do you do? Do you? Do you have to start the song over, or do you just continue from that? Whenever? Oh, I mean, like a lot of times, uh, uh, that would happen during sound check. Luckily, oh, that's and so like, but you know, it's, it's equally bad because you got to go on. You got the show is gonna start in like an hour, and your computer just completely stop, right? Mm -hmm. And then like, uh, oftentimes, you know, the computer needs to like kind of, I don't know, like rest, and then sometimes it'll work when you reboot it, and then then like, then you got to try to like like place it somewhere where it's not vibrating too much and uh that kind of stuff so uh but i think uh you know like, like i said like i think if you're using like ssd drives uh it should be much better i think yeah, yeah that's that's actually an interesting point because also with those spinning those mechanical drives they have magnets inside too and speakers yeah. as we know have huge magnets too and sometimes they could just wipe out your complete hard drive so um exactly, i think that's, yeah. that's a good point and especially yeah, I don't know how effect, I don't know how effective the shielding and all that stuff is, but yeah, it's there's a lot of magnetic stuff going on on stage and all the equipment. Right. So like, just uh, you know, I mean, I, I, to me, I think I mean, any digital recorder is pretty, you know, like it used to have hard drives in it, right? So it's kind of like kind of sketchy to be on stage with them, but uh, you know, like I, I think that's one of the reasons why people still use like CDJs for like real big shows because those are really consistent. Right. And, uh, but you know, uh, you know, a lot of DJs right now perform really loud venues and they seem to not have any problems. So maybe it's, it's an old problem. I don't know, but yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I want to kick off this, uh, episode by talking about culture. Now, how do you think culture impacts music? Cause when we talk about modern day K-pop nowadays, we talk, uh, you know, it's just more than just the music, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's got the whole choreograph now it's featured into it, uh, the music video, the visuals, as well as just um, even performing live and um, even down to just the merchandise in itself. So mm -hmm. um, how do you think it got to that point? And how do you think, especially just our culture and impact the music that we make today? You start that off, Kairos? 
Oh, uh, sure. You know, I, I remember I had this conversation with um, these A&Rs during a, a writing camp and they shared with me that, you know, we, we can't um, completely abandon this, uh, this thing called bong. And um, <laughs> it, it is something that is passed down from, you know, our grandparents and music or something that they feel and they express through the, the tone and the, um, and, you know, the notes and uh, the melodies that come through. And that is passed on through, you know, our parents' generation. And then, you know, we listen to it and we recognize it and we find something that, you know, we can connect to or even express mm -hmm. ourselves. You know, if someone in Korea, um, native from Korea, was to try to recreate blues, right? It's like, mm -hmm. do they understand the essence of where that comes from? Um, and when you understand the history of blues and where it really comes from, then it's different mm -hmm. the way you play it and the way you uh, teach it. And so I think that is important um, even within K-pop because when we talk about Fong, um, what is that and how do we find that? And, or how do we recognize mm -hmm. it? I think, that, I, I think that would be um, important as songwriters and producers. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's something that I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, so I guess for the listeners who are asking what Fong is, <laughs> Right, if you, it, yeah, it, it's uh, it comes from the word like pongchak, right? Basically, uh, it comes from this traditional trot music in Korea um, that sort of kind of had its birth through, I guess, uh, you know, like like you're saying, Kairos, it's like it's like uh, blues is it's Korean blues basically. Right, it comes from a lot of hard times in the in our history. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, it, it it was kind of derived from pain and a lot of the sufferings that our ancestors went through. And there's that underlying blues thing. Uh, when it comes to Western blues, you know, I mean, it's actually, you know, being taught in schools, right? So, like, you can go to a music school and b learn blues to some degree. And uh, uh, they would teach it by, obviously, listening to older records, right? Kind of going back to history and kind of learning from the roots of blues and kind of uh, helping students kind of understand the, uh, the history of blues. Right. Uh, I think a lot of, uh, like, writers in Korea right now, who are not Korean uh, probably have been there writing uh, for the past what like less than five years, right? So they haven't really listened to too much old music in Korea, you know, like traditional music. Uh, I I mean me included, you know. It's not like I have, you know, <laughs> vinyl records of all these classic trot records. I don't, you know. But I think just from my time spent in Korea, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of like me, be, you know, from being from LA. You know, when I first went out to Korea, it was constantly told to me by my managers and everybody around me, like, you need to really study this thing called bong, like, and in incorporate that into your music. And this was back in the early 90s. So, like, you know, I was just fresh out of, like, L.A. and had no clue. And I had to kind of do my homework and listen and kind of, uh, you know, by living in Korea and kind of soak in that culture. And it eventually kind of made sense. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll actually talk about this on uh, uh, K-pop evolution, you know, uh, <laughs> How, how I sort of, you know, in, ended up incorporating some of that into uh, our second album for the first time. And that's when we had that, that commercial hit because it so, sort of struck a chord with the local people, right? And it was something familiar to them as well as uh, the Western, you know, the rhythm was very Western, yeah. but it had sort of a common chord. And that's what made it kind of uh, have its unique sound. Yeah. Right? I, I, I think... Um anybody wants to study bong and how that works with um just modern music and especially western sounds i yeah. think you have to study solid records because i think <laughs> it, just like you said the second uh, album too especially the second album like if you listen to it you definitely hear that merge happen you know and um and i think that is like a game changer um especially for k-pop because you know this is something that it really leads to what is happening now and most people don't even realize like one of the most bong records that you hear out of uh, the K-pop groups are like groups like Blackpink, you know, yeah. and these major uh, artists that are out there. Um, and so it isn't just, you know, a, a standard pop music that some people may um, consider it. It is very, you know, even just beyond the intricacy and the, the details of what makes K-pop K-pop, you also have to understand the soul element of K-pop. Sure. I mean, like, you can't just take, like, uh, like an Ariana Grande record and then just translate it to Korean right now and put it out there. I mean, it, you know, some songs might work because it might have some of that element in there, but it's, it's yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, like, I think a lot of uh, songwriters 
kind of, oh yeah, you know, we just we write pop tunes for Korea, and you know, we just like sing it in Korean, and it'd be K-pop. Uh, to some degree, that does work in some cases, but in most cases, you really have to sort of understand the sort of the the like kind of the flow or kind of the general kind of uh, what, what's the vibe of the market, like, and and uh, you know, uh, kind of the the listening palette of the audience in the local market. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I remember, uh, I, I remember sitting in uh, a session for, uh, Will I am and in his like live room, he had everything set up from loudspeakers to subwoofers and everything that, you know, you would see in a club because mm -hmm. it was generally just played through clubs, you know, mm -hmm. scene. you know, if we're mixing a K-pop record, we have to think about the environment, like lifestyle, for instance, like, you know, it's, it might, you might hear more music or K-pop music at the time through, um, you know, sitting on the train or, you know, public transportation on the bus or mm -hmm. you know, walking through the marketplace or, you know, just going through and hearing it through mono speakers um, in the streets. We also have to mm -hmm. consider these factors um, on top of the, you know, what makes a good record a, a great record. Sure. And I mean, if you look gen generally across the board, you know, like, like the songs that come out and, you know, uh, you know, they're done in like what four or five weeks of promotion and then they go into the next. Right. Uh, typically those songs are kind of like, I mean, like if you look at the charts where, you know, like, 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 like a song, like, like a, like a phone song, like a trot song comes out and it, and, and you know, they could finish promotion in five weeks, but they still sing that in karaoke for the next like few years. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So like the, that's the, I think the staying power of a lot of this, uh, you know, the spawn thing that we're talking about is that it's very well translated into karaoke. Yeah. And, you know, people in Asia love to sing karaoke, right? So, like, like those songs have the staying power. And, and even after the promotion's over, they do the, the nightclub shows, right? Yeah. And, and it just keep, continues to go because people love uh, that music, right? That's, a, that's an excellent point. Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, I, I think when it comes to the, the soul element, um, you know, Bong, as we say, as we call it, it's. I think it is so important to study it and uh, and be able to recognize it. And I, I know that sometimes mm -hmm. the, you know, the big question is, well, then how do we recognize it? And you, I think you said mm -hmm. it a little bit ago that we have to study these records. We can't, you know, we yeah. can't assume that it is. It is. It must be this um, thing that you know Asian people like, or you know, like I think there's more yeah. than that. And um, it's not just K-pop. I mean especially in china they're so deep in their the soul element and you know i mean you talk about china that history goes you know yeah so far back so um you know we when we're in china we spend a lot of time just studying um the instruments you know that were yeah. back in the day just bringing those sounds that people can recognize and um and instantly connect with um because it's something that was passed on through generations you know yeah and also i mean you know how like uh like any simple song could be arranged very cool, you know, they could put a cool beat behind it and all this stuff. But I was told, like, I, I remember, like, even when I was little, my older brother used to tell me, like, hey, if a high school band plays your song and you can't make out what it is, it's not a good song, right? And, and if a high school band could play your song and you could recognize that melody and what song that is, yeah. right, then you, you have a legit song, like, uh, that's going to have, like, l longevity, right? Yeah. And to some degree, that's true because a lot of, lot of uh, you know, like sort of the Western songwriting is kind of like almost like monophonic, like it's the same note, like and this and this pentatonic scale constantly, you know, repeating itself, right? So, like, you know, and, and when you play that in a high school band, it's just the notations are just straight lines, basically, <laughs> right? It's just dots, <laughs> right? And then so. I think uh, you know, like like it's like I was saying, like in karaoke, is people like to sing things that are like a little bit more more melodic, mm -hmm. and and so like perhaps in the past, like not so much focus was given to mixing and arrangement because it was all about the melody and the lyrics. That was the uh, the, the most important thing, right? So, but now like it's become more of a audio and visual thing. So, mm -hmm. like they're filling up all the spaces with a lot of arrangement. Uh, and sometimes uh, that's like one of the reasons why songs don't have longevity, yeah. right? It's like it's like uh, it's like uh, I don't know, like saccharin. Like it's it has no nutritional value. It just comes out flash and bangs and like whoa, cool. Five weeks later, next song, yeah. right? So that's sort of uh, you know like 
I don't know. That's sort of the current state of the market, which is kind of good and bad. You know, it's like a double-edged sword, right? But, you know, but like that, the element of bong is what kind of gives it the longevity and just, I don't know, like from, from my experience or seeing it for decades, like that just has this, it's staying power. Like, yep. yeah, it's undeniable. Yeah. I mean, even right now, um, what's coming back and surfacing is, is the bong. Uh, yeah, uh, a truck. exactly. Yeah, I was, you know, I think we were in the same clubhouse room together when they, when they were talking about uh, we were talking about that, and then uh, like you know how they're saying, oh yeah, you know, K-pop's become so international, and then no, it's it, we're like no, it's not. It's uh, Korean Korean charts are actually like backwards, like it's very local. Like you know, if you look at you know one to I don't know fifty, it's like all like K drama soundtracks to like audition program uh, uh, songs, cover songs from the past, and so like that boom right and now they're they even have kugap with you know inachi and all, all those like the new new fusion with korean traditional instruments yeah right that's a big thing right now in korea so like you you got this chart like and you know where it's like all like very very localized sound now like yeah. it's almost one backwards it's it's and then, and then you got occasional like big idol acts that go in there you know uh, when they, when they release new albums, but like for the most part, throughout the whole year, that's pretty much the chart, right? So, you know, it's like the bong, uh, you know, reigns supreme, man. That is the mo I think one of the most important things as um, creators in K-pop is that the bong element is what's going to give you longevity, and um, and I think that is going to really help you understand um, the path or just how yeah. you create, um, you know, the the longevity in, in your career. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, you know, I've, I've listened to like K-pop for for a long time, and there's only like a few songs that's still in my head. Uh, you know, the past ten years, if I think about it, yeah. and like one of them is uh, like Infinite stuff was had a lot of bong in it, yeah. right? And you know, like what's that song? Was it Chiyokja? Like, uh, like that's older songs, like. Yeah. Uh, when when they did that, uh, when they did their songs, I mean, all their songs had this distinctive like Korean kind of bong twist to all their songs. Yeah. And so I always remember their songs. Like mm -hmm. even now, like when I hear it, like I know I could hum the melody and I know the melody. Like, right. Uh, and then and then like the other thousand songs that I've heard <laughs> in the last ten years, like very few uh, stayed in my my uh, my head. You know, definitely, I, it, it's it. It is something that's very important to understand because I think there is this notion sometimes that K-pop is all about just borrowing um, sounds. I think this is a genre that allows um, that kind of freedom in some sense, mm -hmm. um, but it is a very challenging, um, you know, a, a space to create that makes uh, K-pop um, hit the charts. You know, yeah, because. Uh, I, I know so many writers that's written for K-pop that that tell me that you know K-pop has really made them a better songwriter or producer, um, and um, it's it is a very challenging thing when you have to think about you know these elements of bong and um, writing a good song and you know having sure. really speaks to people and resonate um, in the charts and in the music industry. So yeah, it's it's definitely a lot there. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Like, I think K-pop is one of the hardest genres to write for sometimes because, like, I think I think in the U.S., you know, where we are, like, like, I think if you're good at one thing, you could just do that one thing forever, right? Like, if you make really good hip hop beats, you can you can make a career out of that, right? So, like, you know, in Korea, like, they'll take your hip hop beat and then they'll demand you to make like uh, something else completely different, like, yeah. all in the same song, right? Right? Like sometimes, right? Like like fuse five different genres into one song or something and then uh like a lot of people can't like arrange in different styles yeah. so you have to you have to be really like kind of like uh kind of like grounded in like a lot of different genres to even participate right or I, I think that's the cool thing with even u.s pop is that there's no like real boundaries it's like it's not like limited to like you know like jazz or hip-hop or you know pop is sort of like a fusion of all of it right and it's it comes down to sound designing you know, arrangement and all this stuff, like, right? And like, like, like I work with like some session players in LA and you know, they're great jazz players or R&B and then you have them play like power chords and they, they can't do it with that feel, you know? Like something that's very elementary, they can't like, uh, it's almost like you have to suck a guitar to play like that, right? <laughs> this skater, like this punk rock kind of uh, way to play.
right? right? So, and but like in Korea in general, like you know, you have like one guitar player playing like ninety percent of like all K-pop stuff, and they could play like every genre, right? And it kind of and there's that similarity with producers too like in korea like, like you got one producer that can do ballads with full orchestra you know like almost like broadway style and the next thing they're working on a hip-hop track next day they're doing like a rock track you know it's just like uh, you know what i mean like and sometimes you have to uh, fuse all that into one song and yeah. and and make it make sense and all this stuff and there's a lot of demands that are made by you know production companies and yeah record companies and you have to be really adaptable to all that all of that like to even like survive okay. yep. right yeah and then you have to stand out in, in, in the midst yeah so, so it is um it is definitely challenging it's definitely much more than just being random and um i think a lot of times when people consider themselves as k-pop producers um you know i i hear a record that is uh it's missing it's lacking direction it's missing um you know and, and it, it is hard because you know well they can say isn't unique enough and so yeah <laughs> it's, not, it's gonna all of a sudden be the hit you know yeah i mean, I mean you know not not to kind of bash people but i, I think it, it has to do with like a lot of it has to do with a and r too right like if yeah. they have a general good good, good picture of what the final final outcome is going to be they'll yeah. demand certain things and a lot of times they don't so it's like halfway through the song they're like hey can you slow this down to a hip-hop beat yeah. and then like speed it back up here and then uh you know turn it to edm here and you know it's like you know uh, they'll demand a bunch of stuff, and then and then and then uh, when the song comes out, and I think it's true with a lot of songs that do come out in K-pop uh, market. It's like uh, you get this feeling like they're trying to do too much in one song. Yeah. Like they they'll try they'll try to show like everything like each member could do all in one song. Right? So it's like it's like a little bit too much, right? Whereas like uh, a lot of the U.S. pop is more like kind of like single kind of direction like, all the way through, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, in terms of that, since, you know, we for us, we grew up as Koreans, but we also grew up in the States. How do you think just bringing just like, you know, being influenced by, um, you know, like the Western culture has affected the way that we, especially us three, like to make music? Hmm. I think it uh, I think it affects a lot, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I mean, like, I think generally like uh uh, I mean, just aside from music, I think just lifestyle-wise or like life experience-wise, it's just a completely different ballgame. Uh, you know, like living in a multicultural country. You know, uh, dealing with like like uh, or learning different cultures growing up, and you know, just having dope ass radio like uh, <laughs> at your fingertips like every day makes a world of difference. Like. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people complain about the radio in America, but like, like you guys haven't been out of the country. Like, try try listening to radio in other countries. Uh, it, the radio here is pretty good, uh, right? So just being able to like, you know, like uh, switch to different stations w for different genres is a luxury that a lot of countries don't have. You know, like in LA here, like you know, we could uh, turn into a rock station. You know, KLOS, and you could go like listen to ballads from the eighties pop music you know you could do all that here right and that i think to me uh had a huge impact on my kind of musical palette just growing up on even just listening to radio right yeah i mean uh i grew up on like i mean i i, I can't go through all of them but you know just to name a few like some of my favorite bands were um the get up kids jimmy Eats world um you know we got like the group called the offspring you know mm. back they um chili peppers and you know you got uh hip-hop groups i, I mean notorious big is uh, you know my all-time favorite you have tupac but you got like rakim um uh, quest you know tribe yeah. um you know and i i was in love with metallica you know i was yeah. a big fan of less than jake when it comes to ska um you know big big time um punk rock fan you know from the descendants to blink 182 and you can name it all you know and so yeah when when uh when you talk about the advantage of someone that grew up here i mean and and on top of all that i was diehard uh k-pop fan so it's just like you know I, when people are like how you know how do you come up with these uh songs or you know like what is your background i can't really pinpoint you know what makes my music the way it is but i i do believe um that it, it's um 
the answer is in that question. It's really my environment and where I come from. And like you said, uh, Jay Hung, it's it's really I have this advantage of listening to the radio, um, having MTV around. Oh, yeah. And um, and it's, you know, a huge <laughs> impact. And I think I think we grew up in that era too, where it was like sort of the 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 peak of it too. You know, like yeah. through the eighties and nineties and two thousands. Uh, we got to hear a lot of good music. Uh, I remember like Dave Pensado said the same thing. Like he said, like uh, if you want to learn how to mix, go on an island and just listen to a whole bunch of music, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> right? And you know, people go, oh, you know, I went to school and you know, different college and music schools and stuff like that. I think the best lesson is learning from your heroes, right? Like, you know, listen, listen, listen to your favorite records from back in the day, and and you know, if, and if you're if you're into music production, break it down. Like, try to see what. You know, uh, like listen to every aspect of the radio. I mean, we used to dissect it in our headphones, right? I mean, just listen to every little aspect of it. Learn so much from just listening to records. So even like, like you know, like I never went to school for mixing or anything like that. It was just sort of like, like, like if I mix something and it doesn't sound like the records that I heard growing up, I, I just feel like okay, something's off, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, and that was sort of my my go to sort of like safety net. Like, okay, you know, if if you know, if I'm doing hip hop and it doesn't sound like this. Mm -hmm. then something's not right like the low end is not right or something right so we know that from listening to so much music yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean you know i think that's the best way to learn i mean you have to be able to um you have to be able to analyze and and really like listen and, and there's a skill set in listening and uh and i remember um this was something that was taught to me uh, if you want to learn and understand what a good snare sounds like or, or what a good, good snare should sound like, then you need to sit behind someone that is mixing a good snare sound. Otherwise, yeah. your idea of a good snare sound not, might not be so accurate to what uh, the general public receives it as a, a good snare sound. So yeah. um, and this, I think this part of it is so true because uh, I remember um, at Columbia in Chicago, I was sitting in class and um, the professor said, um, you know, asked one of the students to play uh, their song, and their, it was a hip hop song. And he played it, and the, and the professor kind of had this like look on his face, like he was extremely disappointed. And he said, "I, th I think that sucks." I think that's <laughs> good. And um, and he said, "No, you know, that's your opinion. You know, no, you know, that's I think it's amazing. You know." And the, and the professor asked the class, "Who else thinks this sucks?" And um, ninety five percent of of the class <laughs> and then you look over at the students and said, yeah, it sucks. Um, yeah. you know, and the reason why that was such an important, um, memory of mine and, and a moment for me is because that's, that's essentially the business that we're in. It's, it's not really, you know, we have to learn to like, uh, sounds and even genres and music that we want to be the best at. Sure. And like, sure. And like if we don't, uh, for instance, if I'm like making metal music, <laughs> I, I don't like metal music at all, but I yeah. tell people that I'm going to be the best at the metal music. There's no way I'm going to ever be um, one of the top, you know, five or top ten, um, you know, mixers or producers in metal music. So sure. we really spend time in investing and in learning and what, you know, and finding out what makes this genre or the sounds behind metal music um, so appealing to the fans and what makes it so good. Sure. I, I mean, you know, I think the, the real job of, uh, I mean, there's composers and there's producers, right? So producer is somebody who uh, more or less works for the record company, right? And wants to make a commercial record uh, that has commercial success, mm -hmm. right? And I think uh, to some degree, we're in the music business, right? So we, to, to continue to do what we love to do, we gotta earn revenue, right? So we have to, like you said, kind of uh, sometimes even do stuff that we, we, we don't really feel too much, but it, you know, uh, but we have to incorporate it and, and, and it does well and you go, wow, Right, but yeah, what a lot, lot like what a lot of people don't think about is like like just kind of like you know or, or like you know it's it's this constant balance of uh, commercialness or artsy fartsy, right? Right. So <laughs> right. So so we have to constantly like like try to make it so it's viable for the the consumers uh, a lot of times, and like some people aren't up to that, right? And I, I remember working with this artist and. Uh, uh, oh, before we started working, I was talking to uh, a group of rappers, actually. And then uh, they said, like, yeah, hey, you know what, man? You know, uh, uh, like, I don't I don't, I don't, don't care about performing in front of thousands of people, man. As long as, there's a, you know, if there's, like, a 10 people in front of me and, you know, 
uh, and they're, they're, they're digging my music, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And I said, well, like, then you should just go home and put on your headphones and do it for yourself because, <laughs> right? Because we're here to make, like, hit records. Like, uh, yeah, we can't do it for 100 people. Uh, you know, we have too many people relying on us right now, like, uh, in this company. Like, you know, uh, it's a liability, right? So, you know, to some degree, uh, you know, so, cause a lot of, lot of uh, discussion is about that, right? Like, musical integrity versus... Like, like, where do you, where do you draw the line, right? My answer to that is this, right? If you don't love pop music mm. and you try to be in pop music, you're going to have a miserable time. Yes. Right? Mm. I happen to love pop music. <laughs> I dig pop music, man. I love, I love every genre too. I love, like, I love, like, everything from speed metal all the way to, like, jazz, right? Like, even country music. I love everything. Uh, because, it, but I love it all in the context of pop music. Like I, I love pop music. I'm not gonna lie, right? So, for me, like it just comes naturally to do it. But for a lot of people, like you know, like they have a set, set genre, they like to do one thing, and you know, if they feel like oh, I have to, I have to compromise my music, you know, uh, you know, this is or like they don't want to compromise. They want the entire entity to compromise on their behalf. It doesn't work that way. Right. So they might get one or two songs placed and then, um, the labels will never call them back. Yeah. Right. So you really have, to, in order to succeed, you really have to love the genre. Like, like if I hate hip hop and I want to be in the hip hop game, like, what do you, what do you expect? Right. Uh, you know, it, it, you go to Cape pop market yeah. But you want to do jazz, it doesn't work. Like, you know, the, the, the record companies want a different style of music, right? So, you know, if, like, like it, it's great for us because we love, we love pop music. Like you're saying, you, you like music from all different genres, right? And I think uh, that's something that we all have in common. Like, like people who are like working in this industry is that we have love for every kind of music, yeah. right? Not just one. And it's, it's uh, you know, the whole idea of like, you know, my thing doesn't stink kind of thing, right? Like, it's just, it stinks, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're not selling records, you're not going to work in this business. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's the bottom line to some degree, right? I think that's such an important um, message. We're talking about longevity and how do we keep a career. And especially, um, you know, Jay Hyung, when you talk about these things, it's so meaningful because you know, you're, um, I, 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 st I feel like you're one of the few people that are, doing it at such a high level in every time period where you go and you're always um, pushing those boundaries and pushing those limits. And, um, you know, people like you and Dave Pensado and um, those, you know, guys that are constantly reinventing and pushing the envelope, I think is, is so important, um, you know, for music. You know? Sure. Yeah. And, I mean, like, and if you're the guy that's complaining and saying, uh, talking about the good old days when music used to be this and that, uh, like there's nothing that makes you look like an old fart, like, do, say, like, like saying that. Right. And like, you know, if you're not really feeling and understanding the current music, yeah. then you really have to examine yourself. Like, oh man, you really are falling behind. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh, well, oh, the, the music's not very good compared to like Pink Floyd back 40 years ago. You know, yeah. like, uh, that's, that's like, you know, everybody's entitled to our opinion, right? Like, you know, everybody has their opinion. Right. But, at the end of the day, you really have to be in tune with uh, the market that you're trying to go for, yeah. right? If, uh, if, if you're trying to be in the music business, right? Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I mean, if you're a singer, songwriter, and you have success writing, you know, like artsy fartsy songs, you know, it's great. More power to you, right? But if you, if you want to work in the music production side uh, for other artists, uh, they are priority, right? So the artist is always priority, and the label is always going to, uh, you know, cater to them versus the new guy, right? <laughs> right? So, uh, but you know, like uh, being in, being in sort of like, you really have to be up on it. Like it's same with fashion or whatever. Like if you're up on fashion, you're up on the latest gear, you know, you, you have to be really into it, you know, constantly searching stuff like that to be on top of the game, right? Yeah. And same goes for music. If you lose interest in that, uh, then you become a dinosaur, like, yeah. right? So for me, like I, I work through like, almost like three, well, three decades, like, you know, multiple generations of uh, music, right? And I'm still working with like teenagers <laughs> to this day, right? And it's because like, I, I'm listening to that music constantly and it's, it, and I live uh, like kind of the lifestyle kind of uh, based on that, right? Yeah. So, and that, that's really important. Very important. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Cool. And 
I have a quick little discussion we can open up. Now, in terms of people that you like to work with, would you ra rather work with somebody that has a lot more talent versus somebody that has a very strong work ethic? Oh, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Well, if, they, if they have strong work ethic, but they <laughs> suck. <laughs> yeah. How much is other, you know? Yeah, but typically, like, if I bring any third party into my studio, they like like they have to bring something that I can't do, right? Like, if I have to teach them, like, like you know, if I have to teach them how to do this, like, it's just faster for me to do it by myself. Right. And it's not like I'm, we're shooting movies where we need lighting and all these people to do it. Like we could literally sit in front of a computer and make the whole record. Right. So like you really have to bring something to the table to even be in a studio, I think, like with other writers, like you have to contribute something. Uh, but I mean, of course, you know, there's uh, there's really talented people with really, really bad work ethic. But if they're talented enough, sometimes it's worth the time. But uh, most of the time they're not like I haven't met somebody that talented yet. <laughs> Where like where like I would wait for five hours for that guy to show up, right? Uh, and I, I, you know, I think the last time I waited five hours for somebody to show up was Kanye West, so that that was worth it. <laughs> but anybody else, like if you're ten minutes late, like yeah, like, they're like an hour late because they should have been at the studio an hour earlier earlier to set up, right? So uh, yeah, like I would go with somebody with more work ethic uh, than than. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's, it's, the trade off is too much. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does resonate with me a little bit with what Chae Young said, though, is because um, I, I started off with no musical background <laughs> oh. um, and I decided to just dive into music because I actually studied history in college. I wanted to be a history teacher and <laughs> I took right. one songwriting class and that mm. changed my world. And right in my second year of college, I switched to doing music. <laughs> wow. Without, without any skills i played the saxophone when i grew up but that was it um hmm. but yeah I, I just sat down and learned i i told myself uh compared to other musicians practicing the practice practice rooms that i was going to practice until i'm the last one there <laughs> you know <laughs> I kept pushing myself um especially getting to where i am now it, it it was i felt like i mean you know granted i definitely i think you definitely need a year for music i think talent is almost like a standard to be part of this industry. However, yeah. it does require a lot of work ethic, in my opinion, just to really yeah. succeed in the industry. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know that saying like, uh, always late, but worth the wait, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's, there's those people. I mean, they're like, they'll bring fire, like when they show up, I mean, it's worth the wait, but it's very, I mean, yeah, it, it, those are really hard to come by. Like for the most part, uh, most of the uh, like the writers or producers that like like want to come and work sometimes you know if, if they don't have the work ethic uh, usually I mean yeah like they don't contribute very much either in the creative process so like you know I, li I like people who are willing to learn sometimes even if, if they're not like really good at what they do if they're willing to learn and show up on time and and really show like their their kind of uh, passion for it I think that goes further further to some extent. I know a lot of talented guys that just like ended up like completely just, you know, didn't, you know, not making it in the music business at all. Yeah. For sure. All right, cool. So in terms of now, we're seeing a lot of crossover happening from Korea to the international market. And I know Jay, you with Asiatics, <laughs> that was that was a really big project, especially in the international scene as well, too. So um, in terms of that, how do you think we've got to this point? And um, especially now, there's just a huge interest with just the K-pop culture. If, any, mm -hmm. um, if some of you guys want to dive deep into that as well. Uh, I think, I mean, in terms of Asiatics, I mean, that was back in 2011. So, uh, you know, it's pre uh, Gangnam style. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think it, it just at the time, even just uh, seeing like a Asian person on any chart of any, any kind in America was sort of a, a rarity, right? So, um, but I think a lot of different uh, changes have happened since. And I think the one of the best thing is that like, for instance, like BTS, uh, you know, they, they established themselves, I mean, overseas and all that stuff. Uh, from Korea and then and after they reached success then they just sort of 
sort of leverage that to kind of uh, like without giving anything up, uh, like, you know, holding the rights and kind of rationing out like licenses to different uh, uh, parts of the world and kind of went out that way. And I think that was the best way to do it. Uh, with Asiatics, you know, like obviously back then we signed with uh, like Cash Money Records and we had to sort of basically uh, kind of give up a lot of things and just kind of get absorbed by a new label. And um, that was, I would say that was another learning phase of the whole K-pop evolution, like, you know, of how to even approach international business, right? Like, do you, do you create something together or do you create something, you know, but... You know, the important thing is that it was actually created and it was made in Korea uh, first and then it was kind of brought here, which is uh, like the best way to do it. And instead of giving everything up, they were kind of working as partners or uh, hired people here to uh, uh, work on their promotions. Right. So like all those things were kind of uh, learned from all these past mistakes, actually. You know, and I think I think Asiatics was probably like maybe step three into this whole process. <laughs> There was a few people be, uh, before us that had it even harder, right? But uh, I think, uh, you know, and, and uh, I think since like 2012 on, man, I think K-pop fan base has just gotten so big worldwide that um, now it's just, it's uh, bec it's become like an official sort of genre for even major labels to recognize, right? So that's a big, uh, big, big, huge improvement. Yeah. I think that is so cool that like it has become its own genre. Like you go to iTunes, it's you have K-pop as a genre. You know? Yeah, man. I mean, a lot of people worked, fought a lot of different people to make that happen in the past. Like I, I don't think people even realize. All right, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed our episode two. Um, I think with Kairos and Jay Hyung, they brought in so much information. Just, um, just especially where we come from, but more importantly, just how K-pop has evolved to what it is today. So hope you guys um, are able to learn and you guys had a good time. Uh, please smash that like button, subscribe. Uh, feel free to follow us on TalkBack on on Instagram, um, as well as these fine gentlemen here. Um, and yeah, see you guys next time.